Hey everybody, this is the Treatment Free Beekeeping Podcast. Welcome back to another episode. I have today, really exciting, uh, Alaskan beekeepers. Now, normally I would record the whole episode and then record this intro right afterwards so that I would know what I'm talking about. However, today I'm doing something new and exciting. I'm just going to start recording and then I'm going to call the guys and then it's all going to happen and you're going to hear the whole thing happen. So... If you like that sort of thing, this is how we make the sausage. If you don't, whatever. All right, let's call Tim. Hello. Tim, is that you? Hey, is this Solomon? Yes, it is. How are you today? Um, well, hang on, let's get your levels. Okay. Go ahead and say something. It's a beautiful day in Alaska. It's like 70 degrees, I think. Great. Burning up, burning up. Just had a mild disaster where my neighbor got a bunch of bees in her hair. <laughs> and so, that sounds exciting. Yeah, yeah, for me, probably not for her, but you know, <clears throat> that's why I keep my hair short, man. All right, let me see if I can get Nathan on the line. I'm Nathan. Oh, thought you were Tim. Tim. Who's Tim? Yeah, Tim Huffman. Uh, Tim, Tim's this, uh, he's, he's a little newer. Um, last year was his first year, but he got like four of his hives, I think through the winter out of six. So he's, uh, he's pretty stoked and pretty active on all the different forums. And, and, uh, he's the vice president of our little bee club. I'm the one that, that you met at the symposium a couple of years ago up here. This is Tim. Hey, Tim. Hey, Solomon. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? I can. Let me see if I can get Nathan on here. Okay. Nathan, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Is Tim still there? Dead guy. No. Merge calls. There we go. All right. Do I have both of you? Yes. I have Tim anyway. Okay. There's Tim. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm really excited. Let's just let's just jump right into it. Make sure everything's coming through. <laughs> Looks like it. I'm really excited right about uh, talking to Alaskan beekeepers because I've been told for years that Alaskan beekeeping, especially treatment free beekeeping in Alaska is totally and completely impossible. So, uh, so I, I just want to get into like what you do first and then a little later we'll move on to how you do it. So, uh, who wants to start? Nathan. Um, Sure. Yeah. So it's funny because I've been told the same thing for the last probably 10 years that not only treatment free, but just you can't get bees through the winter. And then over the last um, probably four or five years, I've, I've been told over and over again that, you know, if you don't treat, you're not going to have bees in the spring. But I've got a lot of bees. I'm looking at bees right now, actually, that are uh, some of them. It, it, we're a little bit behind compared to most years, but some of them are so big that I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to split them before they start swarming on me, which is fine. That's perfect for me. But, um, like last year, I, I got about 70% of my highs through the winter. Sometimes it's as low as 50 or 60% and sometimes it's higher, but yeah, it's, it's uh, going good, and and I've been doing this for almost ten years. Tim just started last year, and I don't know exactly what his numbers are, but it was it was good. It, Tim, you want to jump in there, Tim? Well, I went into the winter with three um, large colonies, and I guess um, because I didn't know you couldn't overwinter bees, they all <laughs> made it just fine. I had two smaller colonies that didn't make it. Part of that was beekeeper error. Um, I didn't have the space um, right for them. Some empty frames in there that I didn't know were empty. And uh, but I think mostly it was size. I just didn't have enough bees in those boxes. And how many? Uh, yeah. How many hives do you usually overwinter? Both of you. Well, Nathan. Um, <laughs> I usually overwinter like twenty-five to thirty. 
Okay, so we're not just talking about a couple of hives in the backyard. You actually have a good number of hives. Yeah. Yeah, I've had as many as 40, but something like that. But that was a little too much with running my businesses and everything. And what is the source of your bees? Package bees originally. You know, I like this year I got four packages, but the other 19 hives I have are all overwintered hives or like a swarm that that moved in at some point. I just found them yesterday, so. But yeah, originally it was from package bees. Do you get many swarms up there? Eh, if I do, I don't catch them. I've only caught maybe like five or six in the last eight years that I've really been intense about beekeeping. Tim's probably caught as many as I have. <laughs> I got one last year in the cemetery of all places. And I've heard, I've heard that all the swarms that do happen are actually swarmed out package hives from the same year. Is that true? Either that or overwintered colonies, but there has been a couple of, of, uh, colonies that were found in trees that appeared to be uh, possibly multi-year hives by Keith Malone. Yeah, Keith told me about some of those um, when I was up there as well. But they haven't well, we found really... bees in the. They haven't found living hives. They have found evidence. You know, like a tree went down and there was comb that was old. Well, there was right bees in there too. There, there was bees in there too, but like the okay. tree had fallen and it had been getting rained on and it broke. So I there see. were some bees still in it, but it looked like it had taken a beating from the storm. Well, let's uh, now that we've now that we've proven it is possible. That was the number one priority. Um, let's sort of get get into the normal realm of the podcast and uh, let's start with how you got into bees and um, what what your sort of operation is today. Let's start with Nathan. Okay, well it was something that actually Keith Malone, um, I own a health food store and Keith Malone would be would come in from time to time and I had another guy I was buying honey from and it's just, it was always something that intrigued me, you know, just the idea of kind of like gardening, you know, you it's almost like you plant something and, and watch it grow. Um, but I also had a hard time getting local honey that was, that was clean and getting it consistently that, you know, wasn't made on somebody's stove top or something, or, you know, but that's how I got into it. And the first couple of years, I, I just kind of, kind of like more of a bee haver. You know, um, but the last eight years, I've been pretty serious about it. And I was thinking about that driving over here. And uh, I would say eight years ago or around seven years ago is when I kind of went from like doing honeybees or whatever to feeling like that's part of my identity and I'll always be a beekeeper. But I never had any idea of doing anything other than wanting to be able to be self-sufficient and sustain myself, which, which I'm still a little, a little ways off from, I'm getting closer. Um, but, uh, yeah, the idea of not overwintering never, never crossed my mind. And now it's actually kind of taken over quite a bit of my store too. And as far as like selling equipment and, and teaching classes and, you know, doing the bee club and all that stuff. So it's actually, little by little taking over my life (laughs) you know do you sell any of your own products oh yeah absolutely that (laughs) sorry about that (laughs) i had these dive bombing me there so Uh, but yeah i sell (laughs) i sell uh uh, the beeswax and the honey um i was trapping pollen for a while but it seemed to affect my overwintering success so i stopped um i just didn't d- didn't find it worth it to uh trap the pollen if it was going to affect um how my bees did over the winter and it, it certainly seemed to uh, affect them 
you know, it seemed like most of the hives I would trap pollen from were not surviving the winter. So I stopped that about four, probably four seasons ago, you know? So yeah, that's pretty much it. Just the honey and the bees wax these days. And Tim, how about you? How'd you get into beekeeping? Well, I've wanted bees ever since I studied them a little bit back in grade school and I'm in my early 60s now, so it just took a long time to take. I uh, had a friend of mine I told that to, and he said he'd always wanted it to, wanted to do bees as well, and finally decided uh, um, that last year was going to be the year. And he's the perfect bee partner. He uh, he covers half of the expenses, and I get to do all of the beekeeping. <laughs> that sounds exciting. I like so it. I got yeah, I got uh, two uh, packages last year um, installed in the mid-April. Uh, built that pretty good. I split one in uh, late June uh, to get to three. And I caught a swarm to get to four, and I found some bees living in a two-sided fence that had swarmed out of somebody's Jeez. Um, hive. So I got to five, um, and then... Um, I had I tried to overwinter some what we call orphan bees or these bees that these people who kill their bees every year after harvesting and some folks if you get them early enough they've been able to nurse them through the winter getting to build up a little bit in the fall and nursing through the winter um, so I had that one but I ended up combining a couple so I went into winter with five um, colonies three large ones and two small ones and the three large ones all came through the blind colors. And just so people understand what exactly they're dealing with, what exactly you guys are dealing with up there, let's talk about the climate. Because when I was up there, it was it was like the what, like the second or third week of January. Uh it never got above like twenty degrees while I was there. There was six inches of snow on the ground. Um yeah, I mean it's 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 Alaska for crying out loud. We were we were having breakfast and the sun came up at like eleven in the morning, and the sun was up for like half an hour and then it went behind a mountain and it like went down again, and then it went out from the mountain it was up again, and that was a, a totally new experience for me. So, why don't you guys tell me tell me what it's like to live there year round? Uh, well, Tim's lived here a lot longer than I have, I think. I've been up here since, since 1983, but, but yeah, it's, the summers are great. The summers are a lot like it would be down in Oregon or Washington. Like, I think it's 70 degrees right now. Um, and of course, we go from that really, well, I guess I'll start in January. So in January, we've got the, depending on the latitude you're at, or longitude, I could be backwards. But anyway, depending on how close you are to the Arctic Circle, that basically dictates how much uh, sunlight you have each day. So in January, I think it's like maybe four hours, five hours, something like that, that the sun's kind of up. But then it goes from that to gaining light every day until you hit the summer solstice, which is uh, coming up in, I think, about two or three weeks. But And then it's light for like probably 18... 20 hours a day, depending on where you're at. So we do get a pretty intense season, um, you know, as far as the bees being able to gather lots of forage and all that and build up quickly. Um, but depending on the year, like this year, I saw the first pollen coming in, um, I believe it was around the 20th of March, you know, um, but then there's other years where it might not be until May. And then we have, you know, kind of a race to get them built up as quickly as we can so that we can split them, um, you know, to, to increase or replace what we lost over the winter and also have them ready for the, the nectar flow, which is only usually three to four weeks, mostly in July. Um, and then it just, and when the nectar stops up here, it's like, it's almost instant. You know, you go from all these, all this fireweed and sweet clover and, you know, um, whatever, you know, different types of dandelions to, almost nothing within a matter of a week or two and then you've got a bunch of very aggressive sometimes bees looking for food and 
it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, and then it's just time to start doing your best to prep them for winter and not take too much of the honey or not take any honey, depending on how they did, so that they've got enough uh, to last them that long winter, you know. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of a, a, a brief synopsis of it. But, um, you know, and, and I still kind of consider myself fairly new or intermediate, you know. Um, I, I'm still on my first decade, so I, I still have so much to learn, and a lot of it's unexplored because when I started, really Keith Malone was the only guy I knew that was not only overwintering honeybees but was a big proponent of it and was actually had this, this goal to um, try to use the overwintered hives he had to breed more queens and then disperse those out to other people and try to make a better genetic to for Alaska and I always try to you know give him credit for that because he was kind of the, the first at least as far as I knew of and so a lot of this is so new and you know but more and more people are, are getting on board Tim is new but he's a really smart dude and he's he's good at, at, at keeping records and you know I like him we, you know we run that club together and I'm not good at that kind of stuff so I'm happy to happy to have him. <laughs> so your turn, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any follow up questions for uh, Nathan on what he just said before I chimed in? No, go right ahead. Well, um, so I have a lot of conversations with non Alaska people on a couple of different beekeeping sites, and uh, they're always quick to point out that that cold is not the issue which i don't disagree with but it's the sheer duration of our winters that are the challenge so the last pollen is available in august the next pollen is available in late march if the weather's good and so the weather good meaning in the mid 40s and our bees are flying in the mid 40s um and um Hopefully you have a nice sunny spot where there's a little ambient temperature gain against a tree line is really good. Um, and when was our first flowers, Nathan? Uh, those dandelions this year, it got cold again. It was May, wasn't it? Yeah, the dandelions came pretty late. Our tree pollen came pretty early, like the willows. They were, they were um, putting out pollen like back in the third week of March, I think some people might have even said a little bit earlier than that. So I was excited, man. I was out there taking pictures and videos and I was like, man, you know, the, everything's going to be different now, you know, but then all of a sudden, yeah. Winter came back. <laughs> yeah. Winter came yeah. back for a good five weeks. Yeah. So, so if you're, if, so our first nectar was dandelion nectar. And that's May. And you don't have any other flowers at all until at least the third week of May. And more like the very last of May and first of June. So it's really just a very short season. So, um, so just trying to figure out a way to get a supplemental, um, sugar syrup when they need it and, um, having enough stores going into winter. Um, it's just a real challenge. And, and uh, the whole, of course, the with that long winter it brings in the, how are you going to ventilate them? Are you going to use an upper entrance, or only a lower entrance? And you know the ten thousand theories on ventilation that are out there. Um, so uh, if yeah. I were if I were going to design a bee to do well in Alaska, I'm just going to I'm just going to throw some stuff out there. You tell me if you agree or disagree. Can I just say, hey, Solomon, let me just say something real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Because I, I, I real, it, it, it uh, relates directly to what you're about to say. You asked where we get the bees, and Nathan said packages. But he also touched a little bit on Keith's uh, breeding program, which Keith takes queens that have successfully made it through um, two winters and ships them south to be mated during the winter so that we have survivor stock descendants available. Um for our queens in the spring but we also try to get different survivor stock as well and so the packages we get are from a number of different places and there are um, some Troy Hall queen daughters that come from where Nathan Vermont. New, New England 
Oh, Vermont. Yeah. And then uh, um, there's uh, Russians and Carniolans. And, and so one of our dilemmas is that so many people that, that just uh, kill their bees in the fall, they get Italians because they're so prolific. And, and Italians do not overwinter well in our climate. And so open mating, it, it's, it's just problematic to try to retain the genetics of bees that are doing well with overwintering. So I thought I'd give you the background about telling you what bees we have, and you were going to tell us how you were going to build our bee of the future. Which I'm very interested. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wish I knew how to build bees, but I'm just going to I'm just going to have some hy- hypotheses. So okay. I would be. It would seem to me that you'd want bees that collect a lot of pollen because they're going to need that. You would want them to have. You'd want them to be pretty frugal in uh, keeping stores over winter, overwintering, overwintering with maybe a relatively small cluster. Um, you'd want explosive brood up in the spring at the right time, which might be difficult. Um, and of course, you'd want massive honey production. Does that sound about right? I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where that's where Nathan and I that's are a little different that. because Nathan Nathan wants to rely on honey production because he sells it at his store. For me, honey production would be awesome, but mostly I'm in it because the bees are so fascinating to have. So, um, so I'm, I'm in it for both. Yeah. So both. I, I have a little more leeway. But um, I am looking forward to seeing some of my overwinter colonies produce some honey because uh, I didn't harvest any honey the first year off of any of those. And, um, and I don't know um, in the classes Nathan teaches, he's, people always want honey the first year. He you know, just goes, oh, well, you know, I guess you could take a frame of honey. It might not hurt, but I wouldn't. <laughs> Honey's like the vibe, the way I look at it, and this, and I got to give. Keith the credit for this um, but uh, he says um, you know the bees are the resource and the honey is the byproduct it doesn't matter what kind of honey bees you have they're all going to produce honey so if you are successful in raising bees you're going to have honey so that's that's kind of how I how I look at it you know but I would probably do the bees even without the honey because I'm addicted as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Keith's got a lot of those pithy sayings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a he's a saying machine, that guy. <laughs> so right now, today as we record, it is June tenth, and I actually have uh our summer came or our spring came about a month late. We're just now getting blackberry blossoms, which would have happened should have happened a month ago. Um but then it went straight into our very high temperatures, which normally wouldn't be around till July. So it, as I'm looking at the thermometer right now outside, it is 98 degrees and has been oh. all afternoon. Wow. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah, so it's pretty warm. So I could go for 70 right now. <laughs> yeah. So where are bees um, in their, uh, where your colony development, where you are now? Uh, Solomon, in terms of when you could have started producing queens or splitting? Or... Well, depending on the year here, it's starting in early April would be really good. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> but this year it's been, uh, like I said, everything's late. The morel mushroom crop was a month late and then it got really hot and so it just kind of disappeared. Um. So it's an odd year. I've already done, I've already done, I guess you could say two rounds of splits. Um, but I've also just moved into a new property here next to the river. So I don't know how well, how well the bees are going to do throughout the year. Cause I'm, I'm now surrounded by a lot of irrigated farmland. So there's going to be, it seems to me there's going to be some blossoms all throughout the summer, which isn't really something I've experienced before. Um, but as far as, as as beekeeping in general, I'm having a pretty good time right now because everything's kind of easy. It's it's warm in the daytime and cool at night, and and 
plenty of flowers around. Nice. So you said you're on your second round of splits already? Yeah, I just, well, I did one, I did one batch of splits and then I just did another batch of splits. Uh, I didn't, I didn't split the same ones twice or I didn't split the, I didn't split the babies again. Gotcha. Yeah. We're just, most people are just starting there. Like I'm doing one right now, actually, as we speak, but, uh, yeah, this, I think this year, especially, um, most people are just now starting to get into that. I just saw the first swarm posted on Facebook a couple of days ago. And of course I'm sure there was other ones too, but, uh, you know, um, like my overwintered colonies are in too deep and I'm putting the third box on, um, right now, you know, and splitting the ones that I probably should have put in a third box on already. And they're starting to make queen cells. So I, I don't ever, I never cut out queen cells. I, figure if they're super seizure cells they need them if they're if they're swarm cells then i you know i'm not gonna try to come back every week and cut them out i've never done actually i tried that one year but now i just figure it's time to uh time to split them and have, make increase off them but but folks that started with package bees most of them are just now starting to put their second box on um i've already got a big form that moved into one of my dead outs from last, you know, the died over the winter. Um, I've already got a huge swarm that moved in there and is, you know, packing those two deep. So I don't know which size it came from, but I'm pretty sure it was, it was one of mine. Um, I don't know. I just like to touch on that because a lot of the reason that people don't overwinter is the econ- they, they're looking at the economics of it. Um, but I have to spend five grand on, bees you know to replace all those all those hives and not only that the hives that i have that made it through the winter are just you know they're booming i do a top and a bottom entrance once they get up to more than one box um and they're just they're pouring out of both of them on my overwinter colonies you know so it's just i wish people could more people could see that and see the difference yeah let's talk a little bit more about methods now so top and bottom entrance. When I was up there, um, I stayed with, what was his name? John. John. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. he, his hives were pretty basic top bottom entrance. And he, he also had poly hives, polystyrene hives. Do you guys use those? Are those common? Yeah, he got those for me. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, that's one of my, one of my friends. But, you know, so one of the reasons, like, like that I do the, the top entrance is we get so much snow that I never know if they're even going to be able to get into their bottom entrance. Um, even with putting them on three pallets, there's quite often so much snow that the bottom entrance gets buried, at least for a time. And, you know, I've got my hives back on different farms, and sometimes it's really difficult to get back to them in the winter, so I try to set them up in a way that they can um, get in and out when they need to, um, even if there's a ton of snow. Um, plus the ventilation, you know, Tim touched on that. Uh, you know, we use screen, most of us use screen bottom boards, at least folks that overwinter. And one of the reasons I do that is because as the snow melts, it tends to flood the bottom of the hive. But ventilation does seem to be a massive key for these hives. Um, and, uh, yeah, also, um, the polystyrene hives, I did start with wooden hives, but I was, I was getting a, a pretty small, uh, percentage of success. And then I got a couple of polystyrene hives. Um, I think that might've been the second, actually that might've been the first year and those were the ones that made it. So the second year I got six. And I just found that I was getting a lot better success with the polystyrene hives. So I think it's been seven or eight years now that um, I switched over 100% of my colonies to the polystyrene hives. And, um, yeah, that seems to make a difference. Keep some, you know, I think the insulation is about seven times better. They fit together really well, so there's not much as far as gaps in between the boxes and and that kind of stuff. So, you know, any, any little thing we can do to 
to help them to conserve energy so they're not having to consume more food, which probably makes them need to need to uh, do cleansing sites twice more often. Every little thing we can do to help them with that, um, you know, I try to do that. And so, mouth guards. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I knew from the beginning that I didn't want to kill my bees in the fall. So um, I was advised to start preparing for overwintering before I bought my first equipment. So I bought poly hives. And we had two long cold snaps this winter. And I went, uh, you know, it was my first year overwintering. Uh, and I was going out and looking at those hives all the time, maybe not every day, but a number of times a week. There's this one beautiful, cold, clear day. It was about four degrees, and it had been cold for, it had been that cold. That was the high that day. It was four degrees. And uh, I went by, and I looked in that upper entrance and just looked at it for a while, and and I saw a couple of bees just crawling around on the inside there, and I thought, (laughs) that poly is doing its job. Because I know that if they were tightly clustered, I would not see random bees crawling around outside the cluster. So I imagine the bees don't get cleansing flights throughout a good portion of the winter. Did you say they don't? Yeah, I'm I'm guessing. Is that accurate? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would say that's pretty accurate. They use, you know, like Tim was saying, when we get a, a cold snap below zero especially um, for two or three weeks. And I was actually out of state during that major one. But, um, yeah, they you can't hardly see anything. In fact, one of the ways I can try to get an idea of who's still alive is the hives that are still alive will have all these con- condensation crystals hanging off the top entrance, you know, from the perspiration, from the bees' uh, perspiring moisture. Um, but yeah, I would say sometimes there's a couple of months long that they can't come out. Um, and then it'll get up to say 20 degrees and you'll see, uh, thousands of uh, bees coming out and dead bees all over the snow and yellow spots all over the snow. Um, and I'll get a bunch of messages and pictures and stuff. Oh my gosh, I saw hundreds of dead bees in front of my hive this morning. And I'm like, yes, that's, that's great. (laughs) You know? That means the hive is still alive, so be thankful. Yeah, I think that um, I actually tried to track it, and uh, I looked for days that I thought should be warm enough for cleansing flights. And I did not – so I saw this Michael Palmer video where he goes, oh, they flew today and the snow was covered with yellow. And I, I just didn't see that until late March. And so – I, I was the only bees I saw fly out. I never saw come back from November until mid March, early March maybe, early March when it started warming up here. And then I saw a bee come back, and I was so excited. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder sometimes. I see so many bees dead outside the hive, and I do see them fly out and they'll land on the snow. And of course, they're so tiny they just get cold in a few seconds and there's no no going back and it definitely makes me wonder how the heck there's still a hive there in the spring but they they make it somehow i imagine a lot more come back um than we realize they must be because uh that's the only way they would survive Nathan Solomon asked about methods, and why don't you talk about uh-huh. uh, when when you harvest the honey on the sure. calendar, and then and then the rapid feeding you do in the fall for how long and why you stop when you do. Okay, so so of course, so just to give you a quick calendar, when the bees start coming out of winter, um, the overwintered colonies usually don't need a, a lot of feed because I leave them a lot. Um, but the uh, package bees will need feed. And, of course, frames of honey is best if that's what you have. Um, but basically, I usually harvest the honey the very first week of August. Um, and I don't take anything from the bottom two boxes. I, I used to take a little bit from down there, but uh, I, I leave everything in the bottom two deeps for the bees. 
So sometimes, of course, you don't take anything from a hive, but whatever's above that, that's in the mediums, that's what I'll take. And I try to get that done as early as possible. Some people will try to leave them on, leave their honey supers on later, hoping that they're going to, you know, get another flow from clover or, you know, who knows what. But, but yeah, I try to take them as early as possible. And when I do take the honey, I put an insulated inner cover back on. And, and of course, when I take the honey, I, it's a good time to do a little, you know, health check on the hive and make sure they're clean right, you know. Uh, make sure everything's good to go. And that's actually the last time I will remove the inner cover until the following year. So, um, I, like I said, I use an insulated inner cover. And as soon as I take the honey, I actually have feed ready to go. So I go ahead and put some feed on them right then and there. It's a little gallon and a half rapid top feeder. Um, and I basically feed them usually till the end of August. Um, sometimes, you know, into September, but I try to do most of it in August so that they have plenty of time to reduce whatever amount of feed they've taken in to reduce that feed down to that, uh, correct, um, uh, that correct, you know, moisture content because I don't want them going into winter with, um, you know, basically uncapped cells of, of food of any kind that's going to ferment or that's going to put off all kinds of moisture. So uh, that that actually seems to me to be really important as people tend to feed their bees way too late up here. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I try not to do it any longer than is absolutely necessary. And usually I'm done by the first week of September, which I feel like gives them plenty of time to reduce that that feed down to uh, to that 16, 17% moisture content that they can cap. So then it becomes a moisture absorber, or it becomes uh, hydroscopic instead of putting off moisture. It can, it can actually absorb some of the moisture in the hive. So would you say that feeding is necessary always? Um, eh. <laughs> Yeah, either that or you leave them all, or you don't take any honey. Okay, but I'm not yeah. making any judgments. I'm just asking questions. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I think it can be done if you don't harvest any honey or harvest very, very little, you know. Um, but as these colonies uh, mature over the, over the season, I do find that they need less and less and less uh, feeding in the fall. That's good news. Yeah. Have you ever tried feeding granulated sugar? I have a little bit. I think Tim did a lot of that last year. Um, but I've, I've either always fed like kind of like a fondant, um, you know, just water and sugar mixed together or, uh, or a sugar brick. Um, but I think Tim did a bit of that last year. Actually, I don't think I've ever done just plain granulated sugar, but. Well, I, I tried a number of things last year going into my first winter and really wanted to get them through. I just read everything I could and then closed my eyes and threw a dart at the options. And um, I ended up putting a, a candy board on, on four of them. And, um, uh, just cause I, I know that what Nathan does is he gets into the colonies in February usually to see, check their stores and give them that sugar brick if he needs to. And I thought, why not just, you know, give them the sugar in advance and then not have to open them up um, when it might be really bad weather. And, um, and I tried a moisture board on one. Um, and that, you know, that just was a, a complete and utter fail. Um, those bees died fast, and it was wet in there. But it was just really wet. Everything was really wet. And so um, I believe what happened was the, the candy board, that hard candy, acted. It also absorbed some moisture. But I, I will say this, that I, when I got into those colonies in the spring, those, those inner covers were just as dry as a bone. I mean, it was it was just great. And I think it's because there were enough bees that 
they were keeping the they were keeping the temperature such that any condensation that occurred happened uh, on the sides of the hive where it wasn't uh, dripping down on them and bothering them. I also added extra insulation to the top. They're already in poly hives, but I figured heat rises, so I added another inch of foam board um, on top. It just made sense to me that if you if you don't want the moisture to condense above their heads and make that the warmest part of the hive. Nathan says he doesn't do that, but I also know that he uses <laughs> a two-inch foam insulation as an outer cover on a bunch of his colonies. So he actually does add insulation on all of those colonies above. Yeah, it's kind of by accident. <laughs> but I do, I, if I could just say something real quick. Um, so I actually don't break into the inner cover in February. Um, I take the main lid off, and my inner covers are insulated with Reflectix as well. Uh, on the bottom, on the underside, it's kind of the deeper side of that particular inner cover. Um, and so basically what I do is I test the weight of the hive. I look at, you know, are all the bees up at the very top? And um, so basically I just take the outer, the telescoping lid off, look through the hole in the inner cover, um, and then I'll put literally a brick of sugar on covers the hole in the inner cover so kind of helps maintain that insulation and then put an extra box on and a lid on top of that um and they usually don't eat much of it though so i actually didn't do that last year um or maybe i did it on a couple but uh for the most part they they didn't need it so um i'm trying to get to the point where sorry go ahead jim i was just gonna say Mine didn't need it either. I mean, I yeah. when I got in there, finally, they had plenty of uh, capped sugar syrup honey available to them. So they got up there and they ate that, but um, they didn't need it from a resource perspective. It was just me fretting over my first winter, I think. Yeah. I, I literally said out of 22 colonies, um, you know, or 23 colonies, 19 of which were overwintered hives, I said like um, 50 pounds of sugar. Like that's how much sugar I went through with all those colonies this, this spring. Ah, son of a... Ouch. Sorry. Did you get stung? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right in the neck. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just... I'm in the field. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, right in the back, man. <laughs> well, what uh, what other tips and tricks do you think you have that could help beekeepers in Alaska or maybe beekeepers in Colorado who are up in the mountains, just anybody in a cold <clears throat> environment? Well, for me in particular, I, I definitely would recommend staying away from bees like Buck Fast, Italians, um, you know, unless you're getting them so, from somewhere that is, you know, like they've been, uh, overwintered outside in a, in a cold climate, you know, um, and, uh, I would try to like, you know, people like to feed pollen replacement. Um, you know, and I, you know, I'm not judging anybody, whatever they got to do to be successful, but, um, I've, if you can feed them some kind of mixture with real pollen in it, it seems to help, you know, and, uh, I think getting those insulated hives is a, is a good way to go. The warmer they can stay in the beginning, um, the more the, the cluster can spread out and the, the less, um, food they're going to have to consume just to maintain their heat. Um, you know, little things like that seem to seem to make a big difference, but I think genetics might be the, the most important thing, you know, you touched on um, a type of bee that's frugal, that winters over in a smaller cluster, you know, and to me, that's Russian bees. I, I've read that about Caucasians, but I've only had the uh, opportunity to use them a few times. I, I really think Russian bees are probably the best for uh, colder weather climates, higher elevations, um you know, and also there's this kind of this thing these days about, um, you know, the single brood box method. And I just think that's a terrible idea. It's like putting a plant in a little tiny pot, you know, 
if you want to get a healthy colony, I feel like they need to be big, you know, and to have a strong immune system and maintain the right temperature and humidity and, and all that. So I, I don't see how you can do that in just one box. But, and also patients um, about allowing them to build up that first season and leaving, you know, and if you can uh, control yourself, uh, don't take any of the honey, leave them, at least leave them two big boxes. Um, what, what do you do down there in Oregon? How many boxes do you want to roll on? Uh, I usually do at least two, usually more, but hives here can, uh, a well, a well apportioned single deep can survive the winter. No problem here. We don't have, yeah. I have a fairly mild winter though. It is wet and moist. So as long as you have good, uh, as long as you have ventilation take care of, taken care of, you have a good solid lid that, that keeps water out the bees. I mean, uh, yeah, a single deep will, will usually do it. Yeah, I've actually wintered over in six frame nukes as well. Oh, that's um, that's another thing too. Is I, I think everybody should get into you know making their own splits, and I like to do that into six frame nukes because then I can stack two of them on top of each other, um, and they seem to they seem to do just as well, maybe even a little bit better with the two six frames on top of each other just based on the way they like to move uh vertically plus you know i just like those little six frame nukes because i can move them around to different places a little easier you know but it doesn't have to be a nuke i i guess i just people should get into making their own splits um it uh you know it allows the colony to make their own queen uh which i think you know 90 percent of the time at least that a queen that the hive makes on their own is going to be better than the one you purchased, unless, of course, you started with a swarm. Um, but that seems to be something people are almost afraid of. Is like, ah, queen cell, I got to chop it out of there. You know, I had a guy, guy call me today. Uh, if he's listening, you know, you're the man. But anyway, he called me today <laughs> and he said, oh, I found a virgin queen and I can't find my Mark queen. And I said, well, what did you do with her? Oh, I put her in a cage because I don't think she's made it. You know, well, how's she going to get mated then? If she's not mated, you put her in a cage. But, you know, people got to stop being so scared of those queen cells, man. The worst thing could happen is if you lose a swarm. Um, and, you know, what, so what, you know? But it, that that's kind of a, almost a phobia. People need to learn to read that and understand that there's a lot of different reasons they're making queen cells at different times of year. Um, and, you know, it's, it's for a reason, and it's a lot easier and a lot better in the long run to just work with them than to try to fight those those instincts, you know. Speaking of splits, how do you do your splits? What time of year? You said six frame nukes. Can you get into a little bit more detail? Yeah, absolutely. Like what I'm doing right now is um, basically I'm taking this overwintered colony that I don't want to make it real small because Tim and I were going to breed some queens off of it because it's. This is the four. This has survived three years, so this will be the fourth. And I haven't had one survive the fourth because I'm always donating the queens to keep in the fall, you know. But um, you know, so I don't want to take too much from it. But it's going to swarm if I don't, and I'd rather make a split off of it than have a high probability of losing the swarm. Um, so basically, what I do with this one, I'll take two or three frames of cap brood, like. Um, the thickest frames I can find of cat brood and put them in that nuke. And I'll find the queen as well and put her in that nuke. Um, whatever frame she's on, I'll go in there and then I'll take a frame of, of honey and a frame of pollen. And I'll put that in a six frame nuke and I'll usually move it, you know, to a different location so that I don't have a ton of the bees, um, drifting to there cause the queen's in there now. So, cause I used to put them right next door, but, um, but yeah, usually I use a six frame nuke, two or three frames of cap brood, um, you know, a frame of honey, a frame of pollen and whatever frame the queen's on will usually have feed on it as well. Um, and move that to a different area of the, of the bee yard. Um, you know, and not leaving all the open brood in the main colony there allows them to make their new queen. Sometimes they're already making queen cells, of course. Um, you know, and the reason I do the cat brood 
is because they generate their own heat. They're not going to require a bunch of food until they start emerging. And being that so many of the adults are going to go back to the main colony, that ensures that, that they should have a good population. I used to do it in late uh, June or early July, but um, I'm only, I've only been getting about a 50% success getting those nukes through the winter. And I'd like to get that up to 60, 70%. So, um, especially, well, there's that. And also these hides are getting so big so early as, you know, they've made it through so many winters. They're just mature colonies, I guess. Um, but I, I got to split them early or, um, they're going to swarm. And, and I usually don't catch them when they swarm. You know, the, my apiaries aren't at my home. So I can, and, and the vegetation's so thick that, it's pretty unusual for me to find a swarm from my own yard. Um, and then another thing that Tim and I had talked about is when I'm harvesting honey, if that nuke is not taken off like I think it should, I can always steal some more brood or some more, you know, whatever. I, I can steal from the main colony and strengthen them up a bit so that they can at least fill up two of those six train boxes, you know. And uh, I, I broke my ribs last year, so I was only able to do two but they both made it through the winter. And one of them I did um, for a little class I was having, and that was pretty cool because I could actually show all the people that were at the class, hey, here's the, here's the slit we made, and here it is, it's still alive. And I just put a, uh, I transferred them into a 10 frame box, and I just put the second box on it. And the main hive survived, so, so that was pretty, pretty cool. And uh, those, those nukes that I used, they're also made out of high density polystyrene. Um, they're also screen bottom boards. And then I drill a hole in the top to give them a top entrance as well. Tim, you do basically the same thing? Well, I'm hoping to. I, I keep thinking mine are almost big enough to split and I get into them and they're just not quite there yet. I think that um, they built up so awesomely in late March and, and then winter came again and they, they hit pause. So um, th I'm planning on doing the same thing. Um, I I'll say this, you were asking about tips. I actually have a couple of tips. First one is find somebody who's successfully overwintered near you and copy all their stuff. <laughs> 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 I mean, the reason why I went <laughs> three hives is not because I, I'm brilliant. It's because I copied the right, I copied people copy the methods of people that were successfully doing it. I absolutely um, agree. That's one of my top tips. Yeah. Nice. And the other thing is, is that uh, new beekeepers just have to be patient. And when you start with no drawn comb, everything happens in slow motion. And, um, uh, you know, I went up, I've got eight hives now. And um, one of the reasons why I wanted that many this year is because I wanted to get a ton of drawn comb <laughs> and um, so that I don't have to worry about drawn comb again. When I talk to Nathan about, you know, beekeeping problems or some other people, and they'll give me these solutions that work great if you have a ton of equipment and drawn comb available. Um, but it just, it just takes time and it takes time for them to build up. And um, so anyway, I, um, I, uh, I will do my splits that way this year, and uh, I am optimistic that I am going to uh, have reasonable success. I want to. Uh, I'm working with Nathan on trying to be brave on a number of fronts, like uh, trying to graft this year, and uh, I'm trying to some other queen techniques, you know, backyard beekeeping techniques that if we get good at them, we can share with the club, and also um, try and figure out ways to strengthen those um, smaller colonies in the fall. Uh, to improve our overwintering success so that we can become less dependent on uh, supplementing our column, our uh, apiaries with uh, packages every year. Yeah, so can I just, before I forget to say this too, um, you know, there is a club up here. It's for, you know, we started the Midnight Sun B Club, and that is a club. Of course, I'm not very objective, of course, because that's our club, but we started that club because we wanted a club that focused on overwintering honeybees, treatment-free beekeeping. Um, and, uh, yeah, 
So I just wanted to shout out to uh, Midnight Sun Bee Club. As, as well. Midnight Sun Bee Club. Everybody got that? Yep. <laughs> Nothing against the other ones, but you know. I'm I'm wondering I'm wondering now how many uh how many listeners I get from from Alaska. It's it's probably like four. Well, you're gonna get a few more now because we're gonna tell everybody about it. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh I believe you guys have a a bee meeting to go to this evening, so I don't wanna don't wanna keep you for too long. Um is there any way? Yeah, Midnight Sun Bee Club. Is there is there a, a website or any of your information you want to get out to let people get a hold yeah, of you? Definitely. Um, we have a Facebook page, Midnight Sun Bee Club, uh, the Midnight Sun Bee Club forum. Um, you can also contact me at my shop in Eagle River at Regeneration Nutrition, and I'm sure we'll be getting a, a website soon enough. But at this point. We just have the Facebook page, or you can call 907-227-5665. That's, that's my number. Um, I'm the president. Uh, Tim is the vice president. I don't actually know his phone number. It's just under Tim. But, uh, yeah, hit us up. <laughs> and we meet every month on the second Monday of the month. Uh, after today, it'll be at the... Um, Matt to uh, UAF Experimental Farm and Cooperative Extension Office, and we've actually got some hives there now too. So that's pretty cool. Tim, you want anybody to get a hold of you, or? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well uh, I'll say this: my name is Tim Huffman, and there's a treatment-free beekeeper in Florida named Tim Huffman. It's <laughs> not me. He's very experienced and has much better climate, and he's really good at catching swarms and posting videos constantly. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I, if people want to get in touch with me, they can do that. I'm uh, 907-223-4270. Great. And you're both on the uh, Treatment Free Beekeeping Facebook page, I believe? Yes, sir. All right. Well, uh, we will continue to see you there, and I thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Solomon. It's been a blast. And there you go. That's how it works. That's a podcast recording from beginning to end. I, I only cut out a few seconds of silence here and there. Um, yeah, this has been the Treatment Free Beekeeping Podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast, I have a uh, Patreon page. You can check that out. I also have, if you're interested in watching YouTube videos, a bunch of YouTube videos. Come on, cat. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, yeah, a bunch of YouTube videos. I've, I've got over 110 now, a lot of them from me and other beekeeping teachers and speakers and things. You can learn new methods, learn new philosophies, a lot of great videos. Check those out. Those are for your education. Um, I'm sorry about if you had any, uh, background noise. This is the first time that I've recorded at the new house that we bought. It's not actually new. It's actually 40 years old, but, uh, this is the first new episode from there. And I have, I have a cat. Come here, cat. We have a cat now, two cats actually, but the other one doesn't purr. And we have baby chicks, chickens in the background there. You might've heard peeping from time to time. So, um, I think I'm going to have to build like a little recording booth or something because I can definitely hear the road noise out front in the front yard too. So thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for ignoring any, any audio technical issues and I will see you in the next episode.